water bound and I can't go home. Water bound and I can't go home. Water bound and I can't go home. Down in the Hudson Valley. Ahoy there and welcome. You might wonder who I am, but for the moment, let's just say I'm a friend. Let me tell you something about Kingston and the Rondout. Centuries of civilization have come and gone on these waters. Before all the bridges, before any of the houses, even before the oldest trees lining these banks. A band of Delaware Indians, known as the Asopus, were growing corn on this land hundreds of years before Henry Hudson sailed up this way in 1609. Back then they didn't call it the Hudson River, of course, it was called the North River, because it ran north of the Dutch town of New Amsterdam. Well, eventually, a few of the Dutch and a couple of Englishmen bought some of this land from the Indians, and they started to build a community here. They were farmers and fur traders mostly, so this was a good spot for them here where the creek meets the river. Good for carrying food and furs to New Amsterdam and the New England colonies. The Dutch built a kind of fort at the mouth of the creek called a redoubt. And by the by, a lot of folks think that's where the name Rondout comes from, but no one's sure. In 1633, after most of the settlement was burned down in an Indian attack, they built a larger fort or stockade up the hill in an area they called Wiltvik, or Wild Place in Dutch. Then in 1669, New Amsterdam and the whole Dutch colony were taken over by the British. New Amsterdam became New York City and Wiltvik became Kingston, after a town by that name in England. Well, over the next hundred years, Kingston grew and grew till it became the third largest settlement in the New York colony. We raised wheat and brewed beer and bred fine draft horses. There were hundreds of family homes and businesses. But then came our war for independence. And in 1777, New York City was occupied by the British. So when the colony declared itself independent, Governor George Clinton set up the state government right here. And Kingston became our first state capital. The state constitution was written right here, and the New York Supreme Court first met in the courthouse that stood on the same land the modern courthouse is on. The state senate first met right here in this very house. Even then, the house was 100 years old, making it the oldest public building in America. Well, needless to say, the Brits didn't much like the idea that we were what one English general called a nursery for every villain in the country. So they sent a flotilla up from New York, and on the morning of October 16th, 1777, they landed 400 redcoats down at Rondout Creek and another 1,200 at Kingston Point. Kingston didn't have but a couple of hundred troops and one armed ship, and there were no match for 1,600 trained soldiers marching up the hill. So they did the smart thing. They lit out, along with a brand new state legislature and just about everyone else in town. And by that afternoon, the Redcoats had put the torch to every boat on the Rondout and just about every house, barn, and shed, over 300 buildings in all. The wooden ones, gone forever. But lots of the stone houses uptown were rebuilt, and you can still see them to this day, a grand reminder of the days when we were the first and maybe the best capital of the Empire State. Well, we won the war, rebuilt the town, and began a new era of prosperity. Two important things happened in the early part of the 19th century. A fellow named Robert Fulton invented the steamboat, which vastly increased the freight and passenger traffic on the Hudson. And the enterprising Wirtz brothers, William and Maurice from Philadelphia, decided to build a canal to carry Pennsylvania coal down to the Hudson 
and from there to New York City. It was called the Delaware and Hudson Canal. And when it was completed in 1828 at a cost of $1.2 million, it was the largest private enterprise in our young nation's history. The D&H Canal ran along river valleys from the rich mines of Pennsylvania all the way to the Rondau through over a hundred locks. When the mule-drawn canal boats arrive at lock number one, just below Eddyville Falls, they began the final leg of their journey to the Hudson. And you can take that same part of the journey today. For a long time, coal was the main reason for all the activity around here. Island Dock, right there by the Strand, was built to store coal while it was transferred to the ships that would carry it from the Rondout south to New York and north to Canada. Over a million tons a year. But along with the coal, the riches of our neighborhood famously produced bluestone, quarried out of the hills and hauled down to the sloops waiting to carry it to pave the streets of New York. William and Simon Fitch were the largest exporters of bluestone in the world and you can still see the company office they built on the canal to watch the boats as they sailed by with their cargo and their fortune. At the same time, the rich red clay of Kingston's earth made bricks for America's buildings, along with our limestone and natural cement, while our farms filled their kitchens, and the ice we cut from the Hudson kept them cool in the summer, just as our coal kept them warm in the winter. There were also a half a dozen shipyards on the Rondau, building and repairing everything from canal boats to schooners. And one of the great shipping names of that time was Thomas Cornell. Starting with a single sloop, Cornell built a fleet of towboats and steamships that eventually dominated Hudson River traffic, all from his headquarters on the Rondau. So Kingston was a pretty busy place. But it wasn't all hustle and bustle. One of the grandest things that happened around here in the 19th century is something you can see in the great museums of the world. I'm talking about the famous artists that made up what came to be called the Hudson River School. They loved the natural beauty of these parts and they shared that on canvas with their patrons and the public. Now, Pretty soon after the canal opened, with all the new river traffic, it became necessary to build some lighthouses. So in 1837, on the south side of the creek, a stone base was built to hold a wooden light tower with a small keeper's house. And that, my friends, is where I come in. My name is James McCausland, and I was the very first keeper of the Rondout Light. Sad to say, it burned down not too long afterward, and it was replaced with another wooden structure on the same stone base. My watch was followed by other stalwarts throughout the years, like the Murdoch family, who ran it for 75 years. Matter of fact, it was on Mrs. Catherine Murdoch's watch in 1878 that a sudden swell came down the creek and, well, I'll let her granddaughter tell you what happened. Not long after my grandmother took over, a freshet came up and boats came loose at Eddyville and came down the creek. One of the bowsprits came right through the wall of the dining room when my grandmother was in it. Lucky she wasn't killed. That was when they decided to build a stone lighthouse. Built a good old Kingston bluestone it was, that new lighthouse and it was put up on the same stone base as the old wooden one. And though the house is gone now, you can still see that old round foundation. Now, it was just about at that time, 1872 to be precise, that the folks in Rondout and the folks in Kingston decided to merge their two towns into one city, with City Hall smack dab in the middle. Kind of a no man's land back then, but today they call it Midtown. And then, toward the end of the 19th century, something happened that changed Kingston forever. 
Turns out trains could carry coal from Pennsylvania a whole lot faster and even cheaper than mules pulling boats through 107 locks. The first railroad bridge to cross the creek was close to the one that's there today, just east of Lock 1. Well, as the railroads grew, the canal became less profitable, and the last coal boat came through Lock 1, or as we said back then, locked through, in 1898. But even after the canal closed a few years later, Kingston was still the booming transportation and commercial heart of the Hudson Valley. We still made the best bricks in America, and there was still plenty of traffic on the Hudson. And with faster steamboats and paddle wheelers like the famous Mary Powell, people started coming up from New York City for day trips and weekends to breathe our clean air and to visit the old stockade, then as now. And later on, to enjoy the grandest amusement park you can imagine, right there at Kingston Point, near where the British invaded. They even had an opera house at Broadway and the Strand. That building's still there, hard by the boat landing. Now by that time, we had ourselves a new lighthouse, further out into the Hudson. It was started back in 1913 and first lit two years later. Over the years, it was occupied by many different keepers who kept the lamp lit from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. every night while they raised families, saved lives, and watched over the river and the creek. And just like today, Kingston was always a place where people came to try new things, raise new families, start new businesses. After the railroad came, textile mills and clothing factories spread up. And believe it or not, Kingston became a cigar town with tons of Virginia and Connecticut tobacco replacing the Pennsylvania coal. One factory employed 1,800 people who turned out a quarter million cigars a week. And since then, other industries have come and gone as the country's needs changed over the decades. The shipyards that came to life again to help us win the two world wars. Technology always moving on, even as our lighthouse keepers moved on when the lamp was automated in 1954. So we've seen a lot of changes, some good times and some tough times. But we're tough people. And now, in this new century, our little city on the river is seeing a glorious rebirth with a new hope and a rekindled spirit that carries it forward on its journey. But others know a lot more about that than I do. So I'll leave you now and turn you over to someone who'll see you safely on. Nice talking to you. Thank you all for visiting us today. I hope you've enjoyed hearing something about our city and our lighthouse. I also hope that you'll think about some of these images from the past and how they are reflected in today's Kingston. As you heard, a lot of our history is still visible. On the Rondout, in the Stockade, and at the Lighthouse, which is now public property. So in a sense, you are the Lighthouse Keepers of today. And I'd like to ask for your support in helping to maintain it and restore the interior to suggest what it looked like when it was first opened in 1915. Also, after you leave here today, I hope you'll get to know Kingston a little better, whether you live here or you're just visiting. As you now know, this is one of the most historic places in the United States, and the past is here for you to discover, on our rivers and roadways, in the charm of our old buildings, and the wonder of our many fabulous museums. Our visitor center is a great place to start. We are enjoying what James McCausland described on the trip out as a glorious rebirth. This is the new Kingston, and while we may no longer be the capital of the state, we are the capital of the Hudson Valley, with some of the best dining north of Manhattan. With specialty shops that carry every imaginable variety of merchandise from around the globe, with art and cultural centers offering a full calendar of events throughout the year, including one of the most exciting fireworks displays anywhere.
Our new Kingston is a vibrant 21st century reimagining of the town that breathed life into the area more than 300 years ago. Ours is a heritage that swells the heart and embodies a hometown spirit that makes Kingston a wonderful place, not just to visit, but to live and to do business. So stay a while and get to know us, as we'd like to get to know you.